any time that you want to draw a boundary around something and you say, this feature is the thing that makes this alive or this thing is alive on its own, there's not ever really a clear boundary. And these kind of examples are really good at showing that because it, it's like the thing that you would have thought is the living organism is now dead, except that it has another living organism that's piloting it. So the two of them together are alive in some sense, but they're you know now in this kind of weird symbiotic relationship that's taking this ant to its death. So what do you do with that in terms of when you try to define life? I think we have to get rid of the notion of an individual as being relevant. Mm -hmm. And this is really difficult because, you know, a lot of the ways that we think about life, like the fundamental unit of life is the cell. Individuals are alive. Um, but we don't think about how, how gray that distinction is. So for example, um, you might consider, you know, self-reproduction to be the most defining feature of life. A lot of people do actually like, you know, one of these standard different definitions that a lot of people may feel like to use in astrobiology is life as a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution, which I was once quoted as agreeing with. And I was really offended <laughs> um, because I hate that definition. I think it's terrible. Um, and I, I think it's terrible that people use it. I think like every word in that definition is actually wrong as a descriptor of life. Life is a self-sustaining chemical system capable of Darwinian evolution. Why is that? That seems like a pretty good Yeah, I know. If you want to make me angry, you can pretend I said that mm -hmm. <laughs> and believed it. So self-sustaining uh, chemical system, Darwinian evolution. What is self-sustaining? What's what? Well, what's so frustrating? I mean, which aspect is frustrating to you? But it's also those are them. very interesting words. Yeah, they're all interesting words. Um, and you know, together they sound really smart, and they sound like they box in what life is. But you can use any of this, any of the words individually, and you can come up with counterexamples that don't fulfill that property. The self-sustaining one is really interesting. Thinking about um, humans, right? Like we're not self-sustaining; we're dependent on societies. And so, you know, I find it paradoxical that. You know, it might be that societies, because they're self-sustaining units, are now more alive than individuals are. And that could be the case. But I still think we have some property associated with life. I mean, that's the thing that we're trying to describe. So that one's quite hard. And in general, you know, no organism is really self-sustaining. They always require an environment. So being self-sustaining is coupled, in some sense, to the world around you. Uh, we don't live in a vacuum. Um so, so that part's already challenging. And then you can go to chemical system. I don't think that's good either. I think there's a confusion because life emerges in chemistry that life is chemical. I don't think life is chemical. I think life emerges in chemistry because chemistry is the first thing the universe builds where it cannot exhaust all the possibilities because the combinatorial space of chemistry is too large. Well, but is it possible to have a life that is not a chemical system? Yes. Uh, there's a guy I know named Lee Cronin who's been on a podcast a couple of times who just got really I pissed off listening to this. <laughs> he probably just got really pissed off hearing that. Uh, for people who somehow don't know he's a chemist. Yeah, but he would agree with that statement. Would he? I don't I think, think he so. would. I don't think he would. He would broaden the definition of chemistry until it would include everything. Oh, sure. Okay, so you Or maybe, I don't know. But wait, but you said that universe that's the first thing it creates is chemistry. Where the, very precisely, it's not the first thing it creates. Obviously, like, it has to make atoms first. But it's the first thing. Like, if you think about, you know, the universe originated, uh, atoms were made in, you know, Big Bang nucleosynthesis, and then later in stars, and then planets formed, and planets become engines of chemistry. They start exploring what kind of chemistry is possible. And the combinatorial space of chemistry is so large that even on every planet in the entire universe, you will never express every possible molecule. Um, I I like this example, actually, that, that Lee gave me, which is to think about taxol. It has a molecular weight of about 853. It's got, you know, a lot of atoms, but it's not astronomically large. And if you try to make um, one molecule uh, with that molecular formula and every three-dimensional shape you could make with that molecular formula, it would fill 1.5 universes in volume. So the, with one unique molecule, mm -hmm. that's just one molecule. So chemical space is huge. Um, and I think it's really important to recognize that because if you want to ask a question of why does life emerge in chemistry? Well, life emerges in chemistry because life is the physics of how the universe selects what gets to exist. Um, and those things 
get created along historically contingent pathways and memory and all the other stuff that we can talk about. Um, but the universe has to actually make historically contingent choices in chemistry because it can't exhaust all possible molecules. 